You are live at the Literary Lounge with your host, Destiny D, bringing you the newest and the brightest of the literary world right to your ear hole. Every Saturday from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Tune in. Listen up. And learn something. This is the spot for new hot authors who are given the opportunity to shine each Saturday from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we will showcase a new author here at the Literary Lounge. We are taking out the time to give all of our literary friends an opportunity to showcase their work. The new author spotlight is a platform that allows us to ask up to 10 questions or more to give you, the audience, the most in-depth current information about each writer in their literary piece. We will have a new guest every week. Stay tuned. Hey, 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 it's your girl, Destiny D, live on WTLR Radio, and today's date is January the 5th, 2019, and this is our very first show of the year. You are live at the Literary Lounge, where we are on episode 33. We have a young man by the name of James Wright III, who is going to be our person of interest for today, title that he has today is going to be Blood on Remount Road, published by Final Realm Publications. So we have a full hour to talk about him, his new book, um, things that he got going on in the near future, and we want y'all to listen up so y'all can learn some information about him. So let's see if he's on the line. Hello, James. Yeah. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. All right, Peace James. And you. Well, welcome to the show. And uh, I wanted to give you an opportunity to let the listeners know who you are. Um, so let them know who is James Wright III, where you're from, and all of that good stuff. Okay. Um. Hey, everybody. Um. Peace and blessings. Um. My name is James Drake III. I'm from Charleston, South Carolina. Um, I'm the founder, CEO of Final Round United Publications. And, um, the, next, the next question you, you said to let everybody know that where I was from. And, you know what I'm saying? Okay. You so there? how long have you been writing? Uh, actually, um, I've been had a, a a strong gift with just words and just writing, and you know, I, I I've been like expressing myself artistically for like the longest ever since I've been a child, and it started with drawing and things of that nature. But in 2008, you know, everybody just to let everybody know, also, um, I am incarcerated, you know, and um, I'm like in a inside of it an extremely rare situation, and I got a lot of extremely rare things going on, too, as some of y'all probably um, see and notice and stuff like that, if you are actually following the things that I got going on. But I was on lockup um, at a particular institution, and while I was there, like, mm, back in 2002, before this lockup situation, I had this concept for the Blood on Remount Road book. That's a book now, but 
it was a it was a it was initially a, a script for a movie that I had that I wanted to do if I made it outside of these circumstances. But after I ended up going to trial and I lost my trial and stuff like that, you know what I'm saying? I've been going through various different things throughout the years. But while I was on lockup at the time, I just was like, man, I just can't keep going through these things that I'm going through. I need to start like building myself and educating myself and coming up with better ideas to to do better things on a more productive and a positive level. So. You know, I've been like, man, let me try this writing thing because I've been reading all type of urban novels and I've been reading a lot of stuff and not to downplay the work that none of the other authors and stuff like that in the past been putting out. But I've been reading a lot of the material and I've just been like, man, I can write these. I can do better than this. So I've been like, man, let me just see if I just, let me just turn this script into a book. So that's what I ended up doing. And um, about three months after I got off lockup, my roommate at that time, he was like, one of my first critics, my first reader. And I was like, man, bro, check this out. Tell me what you think of that. And, like, he didn't go to sleep all that night. He stayed up all night to sign that game up. He was still reading the book, and I don't have, went to sleep and everything, and I got out of bed that morning, and I saw that he was still down there inside the manuscript, and I was like, man, you ain't been to sleep. And he was like, man, this book gab, bro. You need to, like, write some more, write some more, write some more. So, you know, and from there, you know, just 2008, and – to the present day, this is, this is what it morphed into. You know? Okay, now this particular book that you mentioned is that the the one that's titled Blood on Remount Road? Yeah, that's the one that's titled Blood on Remount Road. Okay, okay. So, can you give us a little brief synopsis about that book? Like, what is what is it all about? Well, that book in particular, I had a um, I had a homeboy and like. It's, the entire book is a figment of my imagination, but the character in particular inside that book been a homeboy of mine that um had ended up um chased up on some murder charges and stuff like that, and he ended up losing his mind and um ended up being placed inside a psychiatric hospital. So the main character in our book in particular, a lot of a lot of the uh, how would I say it, a lot of the characteristics. The main character inside the book in particular, well, not the main character in the book, the secondary character inside the book that's doing all the killing and and whatsoever, his characteristics were that of, you know, my partner and stuff like that because when he was inside the the psychiatric hospital, they ended up putting him on all type of medication, and the medication that they put him on, like, man, they screwed him up, you know, and he had, like, all these different side effects and, and things of that nature. But anyway, when I started writing the book, that character in particular, I kind of, like, contributed that character to him. You know what I'm saying? So the main character, the the the, the storyline is really about this guy in particular. Um, him and his best, him and his best friend had a fallout and stuff like that, and it was it was behind some money and stuff. Me took in like eighty grand, and it ended up getting out of hand. He ended up killing his best friend, but. The chick that he was dealing with at the time that he was married to, you know, she made all these to the, you know, the police ended up getting involved. They found out that he was the one that, that killed him and stuff like that. And when the detectives when the detectives came to the house to pick him up and stuff, you know, she made a vow that, you know, she was gonna always be there for him, she's gonna stick by him and, you know, this and this and that and you know, so like after he he went to jail or whatever, uh, the detective that been involved inside the case he was, like, one of those detectives that, like, really understood the black community and the things that, you know, because a lot of times with, even with my situation now, you know what I'm saying, if people look at my situation, I am incarcerated for a drug-related murder, you know, that I'm that I'm fighting, and, you know, God willing, I overcome it. But, you know, even in my situation and a lot of other situations, it's like when people like me end up in my situation, you got the family members and the mama, everybody crying and feel like, you know, the son or the child shouldn't be inside that situation. And then you got the deceased of the individual that got killed, you know, their family feeling the same way. So it's, it's like losses on both ends, you know what I'm saying? But the reality of the situation is the the individual, how I'm seeing it, I don't know how anyone else might perceive it, but how I done be, be, began to perceive things is like, you know, in these particular types of situations, like, it's really, it's, it's, it, the whole situation is wrong. One individual is not wrong. The killer ain't wrong. The other person, the whole situation is wrong. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's, it's losses on both ends. But it comes from 
you know, the individual that, that got killed in a situation, I could have seen if it had been a model citizen or somebody that, you know, per se, that was living a, a, a productive life and was not a part of the streets. But when you got dudes out there, you know, who robbing and we selling drugs and we doing all these things and we living that savage life, savage things happen, you know, and, and it's sad, but it's true, you know. So, like, when, when homicides and stuff like that happen, you know, it, it's losses on both ends. It's losses on both ends. You know what I'm saying? So the detective in particular inside this case been a white guy, and his character is I, I depicted his character from somebody that you know that I always I, that I always held in high esteem like a stepfather that my mom used to deal with, which was a white guy. He he's deceased now, and uh, may he rest in um, But his character was the was detective inside the book, and he just had this thing to whereas he just had a different type of understanding for the black population and the stuff that we go through and endure inside the urban communities and stuff like that. So when he got involved in the case and stuff like that, it wasn't just him just trying to just lock another black man up and just put him in a position to where the judge can just throw away the key. He really tried to get to the bottom of the situation. So when he got to the bottom of it and he found out, you know, what it was actually behind, you know, he he did all type of stuff. He pulled some strings and stuff like that. So it didn't end up to where the uh, this character in particular ended up inside a prison. He was actually sentenced to a psychiatric hospital for three years, but throughout the course of that three years while he'd been inside the hospital, he just started losing it. You know, the and the situation that with his childhood friend that he'd been going through, the stuff that he ended up going through, it just, it, it wore heavy on him. It'd been tearing him down psychologically. He can't take it. It'd been driving him crazy, you know, but when the chick in particular, his wife used to come and see him and stuff like that. He just had just had feeling in this crazy state of silence. He won't talk to her. He won't talk to nobody. And, you know, and she just, it, and she was pregnant at the time. So it got to the point where she can't take it. And she told him, like, if you're not going to communicate with me, I'm going to have to, like, step away from this or we're going to lose the baby. So, you know, he still didn't communicate with her. He used to just stay at her and just rock back and forth. And, you know, but, you know, she washed her hand with the situation and she walked away from it. So this is where, you know, and the, the, the blood on Remount Road thing comes from with that character right there in particular. He's not out this particular area. He's from a whole other side of town, you know, but this woman in particular that was pregnant for him, she started dealing with an individual uh, like a year or two down the line that was off Remount Road. And this is when he actually got out. This is where he just, this is where like the rampage started and it just turned into some Stephen King, Michael Myers, Jason King. <laughs> type of stuff, you know, he just went on a rampage just trying to find this dude in particular that's been dealing with her. Anybody that's been affiliated with this dude throughout the course of his time trying to find this individual, even just killing him. You know, it's bloody, it's gruesome, and it's more like a, it's it's some, it's like urban horror, you know what I'm saying? Like, it got a crazy twist. It's, it's something different. It's like, it ain't, it ain't your cliche novel. It's, it's different. It's different. You know? I, I, I can tell that it's different. Um, and it's funny that you should mention, you know, the stuff about the mental institution and stuff like that. A lot of people don't realize that um, we we talk about it, like, on other occasions. Like, I've mentioned it a couple of times where the medication that they give people for um, mental disorders is, is, is more of a hindrance or a problem than it is a fix. And um, if you're not in tune to what those side effects are, then you could potentially be setting yourself up for an even worse a fate. Um, I did a piece not too long ago about that where, you know, you, you see those different ads and stuff on TV and they tell you, take this for you know, depression and this, that, and the other, and they're saying how good it is for you for the first minute and a half of commercial, and then the last three minutes is saying, you know, this medication could cause you to have worse thoughts of suicide and um, all these it, it, stroke and, and heart attacks can come from it. And I'm like, and you're giving this to people. Like, you can't expect to have a good outcome when the side effects, are worse than the potential problem, you know, and a lot of people, they don't get proper treatment in those facilities. They get thrown in a hole or a padded room. They chunking them with all these medications, and it's causing them to flip out. It's making them worse than what they were because they that's the intent. 
the intent is for them to never leave. The intent is for them to make money off of using that bed. That their intent is to have that medication funding, um, that payroll. So if you could keep a person in a bed longer, then why not? That's their mentality. And it's the same way, you know, with the regular hospital. As long as they can keep their bed open, that's a potential bigger bill. You know, they may not never see the money, but the bill is going to be made. I, I, I don't like the the medical industry. I don't like the 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 mental disorder um, situation because it's all fake. It's all made up. It's all it's all made. It's man made. I mean, it's I, not something. I, I my whole my my thing since since being back here, I I I've seen some of the individuals with like the most severest psychological state. You see what I'm saying? So and I don't had I don't been I don't been hospitalized <laughs> two different times twice since I've been back here. Nervous breakdowns and stuff like that. But while I was there, oh, man, when I when I when I tell y'all that I saw some of the craziest things, I saw like dudes just cutting their stomach open, sticking ink pens in their intestines, I just just crazy stuff, cutting their testicles out, just just crazy stuff. But so what I do know is that for some people, there are individuals that really do need to be on psychotropics, you know. But for 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 like for the majority of individuals that like just battle like cases of not like severe cases of depression and people who just got, you know, like the minor levels of a uh, 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 bipolar disorder. And like, you know, I, I've been diagnosed with explosive di- di- disorders and all type of stuff. And that they, like my mental health situation, they got me on all type of medications, but I don't take them, you know. And I just been talking to my wife earlier about this and about me and that I just don't take the medicine and stuff like that. I am Muslim, you know, and like, you know, Islam, since me taking my shahada and becoming Muslim since 2010, has helped me beyond dimension with just dealing with patience and just perseverance and, you know, things of that nature right there. So a lot of times, like, with these, these, these disorders and stuff that they diagnose us with, you know, it's really within ourselves. We really can deal with them ourselves. And we just, like, Allah tell us inside the Quran that he's not going to change the condition of the people so the people change the condition of within, within themselves. So and then and then knowing that you know that that's something that we got to do ourselves to better ourselves. And what's even crazier is that the the medication that they give us back here is different from what the end what the people in society is prescribed. Like all the medication that they give us back here is generic, the Prozac generic, the Ritalin generic, the everything, the uh, the Zoloft, everything is 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 generic. So that make it even worse, you know, and you got these dudes pop up with so much problems, dude. It's crazy. It's crazy. I just stay away. Believe it or not, believe it or not, sweetheart, it's exactly the same way out here. Because Yeah. Generic you have, you have all of these Yes, it it's the same situation on the outside because you have so many people who can't afford the real deal. So they're having to, to to buy the generic because they can't afford the 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 three hundred dollar pill or the hundred and seventy five dollar pill. They have to go to Walmart or CVS or something like that and get the generic for like four dollars because that's the only way that they can afford it. So don't think that your situation is any better or any worse because yeah. it's it's rough out here too. Um and you know a lot of uh, like like you said there are some who need help, and I understand that. I I really do, you know, but medication doesn't fix stuff. And it it was never intended to fix anything. It's meant to suppress certain things, but the underlying problem is still evident. And, And a lot of people, like, if you fix the situation or the problem that's provoking the situation, then you can say that, something can be fixed, but when you're taking something to suppress those feelings or to suppress those thoughts, then it's like as soon as that drug wears off, that thought is right back. But if you go through counseling, if you go through um, meditation, if you go through different holistic means of fixing the situation, then there's no relapse, there's no repercussion, there's no side effect. There's a healing process. And see, a lot of people don't want to take the time to 
do that for people. Like, they want to give them a quick fix and, and let them be on their way, but those meds are not the way. They're just not. And and they have more children on Ritalin and, and, and um, stuff when they're causing these problems. Like, a lot mm-hmm. of the um, red meat and everything that people eat, it, it goes into their intestines and their bloodstream, and if they're pregnant, it goes directly to the child so that when the child yeah. is born, then they have all of these deficiencies that they need stuff for, or either it's it's the transfer, and that's where the ADD, the ADHD, the autism, and all of that comes into play. So they're they're bre- it's like breeding ground. They're they're yeah. doing it intentionally. But to get back to your book, um, I, I want I want to go back into it just a little bit further. But before we do that, I want to take one short break, and we're gonna come right back. Okay. So hold okay. on the line for me. Okay. This is the spot for new hot authors who are given the opportunity to shine. Each Saturday from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we will showcase a new author here at the Literary Lounge. We are taking out the time to give all of our literary friends an opportunity to showcase their work. The new author spotlight is a platform that allows us to ask up to 10 questions or more to give you, the audience, the most in-depth current information about each writer in their literary piece. We will have a new guest every week. Stay tuned. All right, guys, we are back, and we are live at the Literary Lounge on WTLR Radio. Today's date is January the 5th, 2019, and we are on episode 33. We have a young man by the name of James Wright III as our special guest for today. We were discussing his new book titled Blood on Remount Road, and also we're about to go into some information about um, the publishing apparatus and stuff as far as how he was able to get his book put together. So we're going to see if he's on the line still. Yeah, yeah, James yeah. Still? Yes. All right, good, good, good. So to go into, you know, a whole other parameter of the book, um, who did your publishing and how did all of that go about? Ah, uh, everything that I that I have going on, um, is is independent. Um, oh man, it, it it came from my grind. Uh, when I first started, like I always had an independent uh, independent mentality. Um, the job thing, I never believed in it. Um, I'm a big follower of of Robbie Kiyosaki and Napoleon Hill and all of those you know gurus throughout history. If y'all don't know who Robbie Kiyosaki is, uh, he he's the author of the, uh, the Rich Dad Poor Dad books and stuff like that. He's a success motivational speaker, entrepreneur. Multi, et cetera, et cetera. But um, those are the type of people I follow, and I've been following them for years and years and years. But I always just had an independent mentality. So, like, <clears throat> even when I got into the into the book thing, I started looking at the, the the Terry Woods and her movement and what she did. I started looking at the Wahida Clocks and what she did and Vicky Stringer and you know all the other all these other uh, um individuals that been, you know, successful in what they were doing, you know, from a publishing aspect. And I actually had a, a brief conversation with Wahida Clark in, uh, like, 2009. And I just, I mean, to each his own with, with individuals that seek publishing deals and stuff like that, but I always I felt like, man, if they can do that, I can do it also. You know what I'm saying? So for me to just give them my manuscript for a few thousand dollars when I know that I can make 150000 or more or better or this is what they're going to make off my projects and stuff like that, why not do it myself? I can I can do that myself, you know? And i always been business-minded. Um, I have a I have a crazy acumen, so, like, marketing, and, like, I'm, I'm very studious. And, you know, so, like, what I did then, man, I just jumped head first. And after I wrote a couple of books, 
I sat the I sat the books to the side and I just jumped into the business thing. I started ordering all type of books on publishing and you know how to self publish and I started researching all type of stuff online. I started networking and just spontaneously just calling all type of people and emailing all type of people and it was like, Man, look, this is who I am, this is what I'm trying to do, you know, you can aid and assist me in any form, like you know, like what like what's happening? I'm somebody that you know, that that that's worth messing with and I won't be away from your time or your energy, that type of stuff. So I reached out to people and um I connected with a good bit of people, you know what I'm saying, that's in like in good places inside the publishing industry and other industries also, you know, so and I've always been persistent and diligent and, like, you know, I'm all work, no play. I always say that. That's my model. I'm all work, no play to the point to where I just be, like, ruthlessly serious about it. But so what I did, man, after I got everything together and started learning everything, you know, I had my little grind thing going on back here. And, you know, through, so like, everything was just dealing with the books and the designs and stuff. These are things that come from, um, and, and, I, and I hate to say it, but throughout the course of the years, like, nobody has been doing anything for me. You know what I'm saying? I mean, my mom, you know, she been there, even though we, I come from a dysfunctional family. I got an extremely good family. And, you know, it's some people that I don't know started back talking to inside the family and stuff like that. Me and my sister, we don't talk. Crazy situation. Long story. Um, oh, yeah, and I got a documentary coming soon, too, you know, that uh, you know that uh, and that uh, will be way more, extremely more informative. But um, not to get off the subject, I, uh, with the final round United thing, like I said, like I started studying the business aspect of things, and I just was like, man, I can do this myself. I can do this myself. So I started designing blueprints and formulas and stuff like that, you know, for the company and, you know, how to go about getting the licensing. And and it's just been, it, and it's been trial and error, you know, and I, it's like throughout the course of the years, I end up with like 21 grand tied up into like all type of designs and this and that for promotional stuff. And majority of that money, been I won't say that it's been a waste of money, but I ended up spending money on a lot of things, and and I just had to learn. You know, I've been dealing with people that, you know, just and I guess taking advantage of the situation because where I'm actually at back here. And so it's been losses. It's been losses along the way. It's been, it been a lot of losses along the way. And, you know, but like I say, it's been trial and error. I learned from them. And every time I took a certain type of loss or whatever, I never gave up. I went back to the table, reconstructed everything, you know, reached back out to people until I started meeting the right people and getting pointed in the right direction and stuff like that. And like right now, I feel like I'm in a I'm in a cool position. And like I said, I've been doing all this since 2008. And everybody over the years be like, bro, why you ain't never released none of your books? Why you ain't never released none of your books? And again. I don't mean no offense to any other author or nobody else that's in the publishing industry that may be listening, but I always told myself that I'm not just going to be one of the, the many broke authors that you see. You see all these authors on Facebook. Everybody got these books because CreateSpace, Amazon, and Kindle have provided a platform for people to easily upload these things and get their books out there with, 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 with little to no cost. You know, so but my thing was always that, okay, yeah, I can publish a book. Yeah, I can just throw a book out there. But if, if, if I don't have, if, if it's not, if it's not benefiting me financially, why I just do it? Just to say, just to tell somebody that I know or a friend, I, yeah, man, look on the internet, man, on Amazon, I got a book on Amazon. But I broke. I just, I just, I just, I've been feeling that. So my whole thing been like to get my marketing strategies together. You know what I'm saying? Get all my stuff together. When I do come out and I do launch my stuff, like you know, and, and I remember watching something um about Master P, which I'm a big follower of. And it's crazy because I just met somebody that's an insider that, that actually rubbed shoulders with him, and I actually got a meeting with this individual at 3 o'clock that I got a call and sit down and talk about, you know, what my visions is and stuff like that. And I'm trying to get him to, you know, like, man, man holla at P and tell him, man, like, we need to meet this guy, James Wright III. But, um, but anyway, um, inside this uh, – this video that I've been watching on Master P and he just proposed the question and he was like, what does it take to become a millionaire? You know, and ever since I saw that and when he proposed the question, he answered it, you know, and he just been like, man, if you can just come up with like a, a, a proper enough or, or a, a, a scheme for a creative enough strategy to just reach a million people at a dollar, technically it makes you a millionaire, you know? So like, man, with the, like this social, a lot, a lot of people don't really understand how, how 
what's the word? That's the word. I just slipped in my tongue. I got so much stuff running through my head right now. But just the layman's turn, a lot of people don't understand, like, how, like, serious that, that Facebook thing is, that Instagram thing is, that YouTube thing, for us to be able to have. Because at one point in time, um, the, we didn't have these things to be able to use, you know what I'm saying? So we had to find, we had to try to haul at these major distributors and these major publish, major publishing houses and, and all these type of stuff. We had to because we didn't have that type of access to, 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 to social networking. Now we got these things at our hands through a cell phone. You know what I'm saying? So my whole thing is like, dang, we this cell phone is so powerful. And it's just like people really don't realize the power of this tool in particular. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, I, I'm one of the individuals that actually understands the power of the smartphone. You know what I'm saying? So, but, um, yeah, go ahead. That, that's actually, like, really, really smart as to, what you mentioned as far as trying to do everything on your own because when you when you do work in house it allows you to reap the most of the benefit the only thing yeah. is when when you don't have those outside avenues where you can go around Amazon or Barnes and Noble or Ingram or wherever that you try to publish a book through it's like they take so much of the the money. I mean, granted, they allow you to do it in advance, like without any money up front, and they do the printing. So that does yeah. take a lot of stress out of going indie, but it also, like, allows you to put out, you know, different works that you don't really see a lot of income from. But I I, I, I applaud you for what you're, you're trying to do, um, and I and I do understand your business mindset as far as trying to do everything on your own. Now, me personally, if it had been me and I had the opportunity to sell one of my books for a couple of thousand, I would have definitely taken that deal being that it was my first book. You feel me? Because that would have built my audience. Like, that's a freebie to everybody to kind of get an idea of my writing style. And then once the name was built, then I could say, okay, I'm doing this independently. But I'm now, the best-selling author or whatever from that first I book. I I don't mean to I don't mean to cut you off, but I would do that also. I would do that now, even after I launch my stuff. You know what I'm saying? I can be like, extre- I can have like, I can you know I can I can reach a certain height and like really be like doing some 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 nice things. You know what I'm saying? And, and be inside a comfortable situation with my company stuff. And I would still do it. I would still like let somebody else release one of my projects. But it, 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 the, the, for me to for me to just give a, a particular publishing house one of my projects, it got to be somebody that's doing way more than what I'm doing. You know what I'm saying? Or what I'm capable of doing. I'm not just going to give my book to somebody that I can do the same thing. And that's what I actually meant by that. Not a random house or Dale or Bantam or or one of those type of or Kingston or something like that was to pull up on me, of course, like, I'll be a fool, not anybody would be a fool not to actually take advantage of that type of opportunity for the renownment, you know, so, yeah, I, I'll, I'll do that most definitely. I just, overall, I just, like, I I am um, pro-independent. But go ahead. I just have one to just get that in. No problem. So, so how long did it actually take you to to write this book from start to finish? Do you do you remember uh, that? Man, honestly, to be to be all the way honest, I wrote that book like in like twenty eight days, twenty seven, twenty eight days, something like that. A lot more than that. And like, but I've, I I I went through like four or five rewrites, you know, over a period of time. But the actual just putting the book down, putting the manuscript on the the the, the first draft of it. You know, I just wrote it straight through because I it, it, I didn't have brainstorm just the, the idea just to move. like I said it was it was initially a script it was initially a movie script you know what I'm saying that I actually had a movie idea that I actually had and that's what I just ended up doing with it um and I'm actually talking to um a couple of people now on behalf of just like some film projects and stuff like that with my material and even a guy that I'm talking to um that I got to meet with at three with the inside situation with Master P. I'm trying to, like, get him to, like, take my situation, like, this this guy right here, that's what he has going on. And, you know, like I say, I got the documentary thing that I'm working on. And even if I can just get it, because I, I have a real situation. I got a Hollywood situation. Hollywood makes 
multi, billions of billions of dollars a year off of depicting movies and stuff like that from 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 lives like mine. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, why not? You know? And even when you see my stuff, I like stand out from everybody else. It's just like, dang, this dude is a this dude is a real dude, and not to be conceited or or anything or arrogant, but. I'm a real situation. I'm a golden child. I, I mean, I know that. And when you see my documentary, when y'all see my documentary, y'all actually understand, like, who I actually am, what I went through from just childhood to the present day, you know, and what I'm still going through and everything that I've just been, been striving and through throughout the course of my my incarceration. But, um, but uh, with that book, with the Blood on Remount Road in particular, that book is really – that's not the main book. The main book is really Paradoxes of Life. That's really the main book. And uh, I, it's a firm that I've been consulting with that I actually had them trying to market me through the Steve Harvey Nation. Steve Harvey is actually a character in this book in particular. And that book is really my is, 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 is really at the for, at the at the forefront of everything that I'm doing. The, the, the Blood on Remount Road, yeah, 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 you know, it's a good book and stuff like that, but – you know, it, 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 it's, it's, I'm not saying that I'm not taking the project serious, but I'm not taking it as it as serious as what I have going on with the paradoxes of life because the paradoxes of life is actually tied in to this crazy marketing strategy that I got. Uh, but, yeah, so it's really just, just instead of the, the blood on I don't mean to shift, but, you know, just to let everybody know that you know the blood on Remont Road is there. It's gonna it's gonna be released when the pair. It's gonna be a double release. It's gonna be released when the paradox of life is gonna be re- released. But the marketing steps that I'm taking towards these two these two projects are totally different. Are totally different. The paradoxes of life is on some commercial stuff that that's that's being shot all over the country to just different industry personnel. And I got a crazy uh, marketing strategy for that. Um, Going back to what Master P said about, <laughs> you know, say reaching a million people at a dollar. So that's the purpose of, of that book in particular with the scheme that I, the strategy that I got for it. So, right. Yeah. So, so with that being said, you, um, you mentioned a documentary. Do you have a title for the documentary yet? Yeah, uh, the name of the project that I'm actually working on, um, because the firm that I've been talking to, uh, they they're like okay with well, me being incarcerated, you know, it, it's kind of hard for them to like to really do what they want to do because I'm not able to, you know, to the 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 to be able to attend like book fairs and other you know, um, book signings and book carnivals and conventions and things of that nature right there. So they just been like, man, if if, if you just can give us something that you know that that we can just blaze all the social media platforms with you. And you know, and and after that conversation that I had with this agent in particular, she really changed my that conversation on her really changed my mind frame. And I just what she said just really had coincided with what I keep saying about the masterpiece situation. And you know, I went back in the lab and I just came up with this with just this crazy marketing strategy. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, the name of the project that I'm working on is called Project Get Free or Die Trying, and the name of the documentary that I got coming is called The Ultimate Sacrifice. Um, okay. Yeah, it's called the ultimate sacrifice. All right. Well, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to take one short break again, and then we're going to come right back with some more information because we got to get all of your contact info and all that good stuff. So hold on the line for me, okay? All right. You are live at the Literary Lounge with your host, Destiny D, bringing you the newest and the brightest of the literary world right to your ear hole. Every Saturday from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, tune in, listen up. And learn something. All right, guys, and we are back, and we are still live 
on WTLR Radio, and you are listening to the Literary Lounge. And today's date is January the 5th, 2019, and we are celebrating episode 33, and we have a young man by the name of James Wright III as our special guest for the day, and we mentioned a couple of his books, Blood on Remount Road, and he also mentioned a, a main piece that he was working on. That, that is going to be released as well. Um, we also discussed his publishing company, Final Round Publications. And now we are taking out the time to get a little bit of his contact information. So um, with that being said, if you have um, website, social media, drop all your plugs. Let everybody know where they can reach you and, and where to look for your stuff. Okay, um, world. As of right now, uh, to to follow anything that I have going on, uh, you can Facebook me at author James Wright the Third, um, and also uh, uh, I like with, due to my situation and all the technicalities of, of the legal stuff involved and stuff like that. You know, I I'm only maintaining the position as founder. You know, so but I do have an individual that's the CEO of, of my company situation, and she's my wife. Her name is Crystal Khadija Alexander, and her name is spelled C-R-Y-S-T-A-L, Khadija, K-H-A-D-I-J-A-H, Alexander. I'm sure that all of y'all can spell Alexander. Um, and when you Facebook anyone else, you see the final line, United Publication thing pop up, and, uh, and that's us. Right now, like dealing with the website, <coughs> It's going to be a couple of days. The website's still in, um, in the process of being done along with a lot of other stuff. So, you know, like, I've been kind of, like, due to my circumstances of being back here, we got some crazy stuff going up and going on back here with the lockdowns and other stuff. So it was not that I was procrastinating on it. It's just all of those things that come, just like I say, Facebook, Crystal Khadija Alexander, or Arthur James Wright III, and is. Everything there that you need to see going going to be there, and also the, the magazines with uh with author Dest- um Destiny Divine, who I'm talking to now, and um and her magazine uh Transparency Library uh you can follow me through there too as I'm gonna be in every is gonna be some type of article or something about author James right the third inside uh um in her magazines, and I'm also gonna be in some other areas uh with Geechee One down here in Charleston, South Carolina uh. Uh, you look for that. Uh, there's some other things that I'm gonna be in other magazines. I'm gonna be in also. I done uh, started working towards getting that double XL jet and a few other people. Just like I said, just like if you want to follow, if you're interested, and just follow on my situation, my movement. You know, just Facebook, Crystal Khadija Alexander, Arthur James right the third, final round United publication. Yeah. All right. So with that being said, um. Can you give us the uh, title and prices of both of your books uh, so when they do become available, we'll know where to find them? Well, they're going to they're gonna be on all the digital platforms, um, Amazon, Kindle, Barnes & Noble. It, 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 they're going to be everywhere, and there's some bookstores and stuff like that. And, and I got a crazy street team and low strategy that I got off of, so they, they'll be easy to find. Uh, and <clears throat> pricing-wise, the Blood on Remont Road, is um is is tagged at fourteen ninety five, and the paradoxes of life is tagged at nineteen ninety five. That special book, you know, and and it's worth it, and it's worth it, and it's worth it because like my situation and everything that I got going on gonna have me like it's like a it's gonna be like a celebrity situation that I got going on. So it's like I say, it's gonna be worth it. The the book is life changing. I I've lit, and it's not no gangster stuff. It's not about no. It's not about drugs. It's not about no shooting my bang bang stuff. This book, Paradoxes of Life, is, is so beautiful. I've lit dudes that that, that, that see themselves as gangsters, like killers back here, read this manuscript, you know what I'm saying? And when they got to the end of it, it, it brought tears to their eye. It actually changed. Like, that book done changed, like, so many people's lives back here. You know what I'm saying? So it's not something to sleep on. It's not your cliche book that you just pick up and you read. That book in, in particular would inspire me to actually write that book in particular, just to say this real fast. I was on lockup for stabbing somebody, you know what I'm saying? And while I've been on lockup, I had a study Quran, and then inside, it's an ayat inside the Quran where 
a lot of talks about uh, he create he created mankind and ranks, which is talking about he's talk, he's referring to the intellectual capacity on behalf of him just creating us in those particular ranks right there. And it, it was going into just paradoxes. And a lot of us, we go through our life and we just be like, well, if a God exists, why he let this little girl get raped? Or if a God exists, why are all these people starving in these third world countries? You know what I'm saying? Everything, these these are paradoxes. Everything happens for divine purposes. You know what I'm saying? To, to give other individuals the opportunity to, to reflect. The same way we have these fields, we walk throughout the earth every day and we step on ants and we kill roaches and we kill flies for no reason when they really just, just, just performing the duties that they've been created to do, to perform. So it's like they got feelings also. When you hit a cat or you chop a cat, when people just abuse these animals, you don't think dogs cry and people just, they, they feel it just, they feel hurt just like we feel hurt. You know, so like when it comes down to the paradoxes and, 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 every, and everything and everything happening for, for a particular reason, when I just been reading the commentary inside that Quran, it really changed my life. It really changed me how I looked at people. It really changed my life how I looked at my family members. It just it just changed my it just it, it it changed me totally. But that's what inspired that book. So the main character inside that book is this this dude. He's the son of this 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 multi this this multi millionaire cat. And inside the book, he ends up being charged with a murder. Uh, uh of uh, he being end up being charged for the murder of a um of a prominent judge, a retired judge, granddaughter. And I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna just, just just get into it because the book is crazy. I'm not gonna just go no further than that. But throughout the course of that book and that story, he's just going through so many things and the people that he's just meeting along the way. And at first, it just looked like a bad situation. Like, dang, I I just end up in this situation. Why I'm going through this? And it's like I tell people all the time about my incarceration with me just fighting a natural life sentence. You know what I'm saying? And it's like I tell my mom all the time that. I wouldn't take this. I wouldn't take this this experience back for the world because I needed it. It, it. it made me a. It made me comfortable. I can sit down and cross my leg like a gentleman and, and just be and feel comfortable and just don't feel like I like no soft dude or nothing like that. Like I'm perfectly comfortable with myself. Um, this experience made me a man. You got a lot of dudes that just sit back and they screw their lives off, just getting high, doing drugs, and calling home and just spending their people money on drugs and just just crazy stuff. Nobody, the, the majority of individuals back here are spiritually dead psychologically dead. It's like they're zombies, you know, and I strive every day not to be categorized as one of those individuals. So, like, but anyway, that paradox, man, paradox is life, man. Y'all got to check that book out, man. Um, y'all check this book out, man. And that, 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 that book is the deep. Um, so, yeah. But, yeah. Well, I'm reading. glad that you were able to be here to, to be able to tell your story and to give a you know, to shine a light on the things that mean the most to you. And, you know, I, I really applaud you for turning your time of incarceration into being something beautiful, to allowing you to um, be a better person, to 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 develop your writing craft and all of that stuff. And that's part of what I try to do to help other brothers like yourself um, with my inmate outreach program, I try to allow the writers who are incarcerated, mostly those who are on life terms, to write, to preoccupy their time, um, yeah. and to also make money off of those book sales to put in their commissary because we have a lot of guys who are behind those walls who mama and grandma just pretty much told the kids that, Daddy went out for a, a jug of milk and never came back, or Daddy yeah. went to school, or you know, and they they leave these people, you know, behind these walls with no intentions of writing a letter or making a phone call or sending any money. And it wasn't until like the earlier part of last year that I even found out that you guys have to pay every day that you're in prison. And could you imagine? working up that much of a debt to society as far as being there on a life term. Like, people don't understand that you guys are paying to stay, and you're giving the worst treatment available. Like, I've had so many horror stories given to me about um, brothers who had to eat in their dorm room while the, the sewage was backing up in the toilets. You got people who don't even have blankets or coats during the winter time, no heat in the winter time, no AC in the in the summer. 
you know, those are conditions that, you know, most people wouldn't even phantom of being in. And you guys endure that. Y'all been on lockdown ever since that mass murder that happened down in South Carolina, which most people don't even realize that you guys are still on lockdown. Like, y'all get out maybe four at a time to take a 15-minute shower, and then you're right back in the room. Some of you guys don't even see daylight, you know. So it's like they don't know what what it is to be incarcerated right now, especially in the South. Um, So I try to shed light on all of that to give people the opportunity to know, you know, even if they're not on a life sentence, if they do get released, you know, it's possible that their writing career could be blossomed enough for them to manage without having to go into the workforce. They can come out as an established author and and won't have to worry about being turned down for a job or not being able to find work because their craft has made room for them. So uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank you um, for taking out the time and being on the show today um, because it really blessed my heart to have you here. Um, Because I know all all of these are special circumstances So I definitely appreciate you You know, for being able to be on the line for a whole hour I know how difficult that that could be um, For those who are in your situation So I really do appreciate you for that So with that being said, what I want to do Is I want to give you the opportunity To give any shout-outs that you want to give Shout your plugs Do what you got to do Because we got like eight minutes left Man, <clears throat> my shout out gonna be brief as I, I don't play no games. I'm I'm ruthless. I'm just I'm trying to change and just be, you know, this 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 more merciful dude. Like man, first and foremost, man, all praises to Allah subhanahu who I to I love. For real, for real, man. Like for real, for real, for real, for real. I just can't say that enough. And to my mama, Sharon Wright, I love you, baby. You know, hope you're listening. And Crystal, Khadija, Alexander, you and my mama, y'all are like uh, the two most important, you know, people in my life right now, man. I love y'all. I love y'all. I love y'all. And to all my other supporters, it's, it's, it's kind of like a little too many of y'all to name. So y'all know who y'all are. And don't get in your feelings because I ain't mentioned your name. You guys say, but, man, I appreciate it, man. Thanks, thanks, and thanks, and thanks, and thanks, man, to everybody, man, who just helping James Wright III, man, with my whole situation, incarceration. Supporting my vision with this final round United OG Dynasty Urban Elegance thing, man. I love y'all. I love y'all. Mwah. And you, D, I love you too, man. We love you over here at final round, man. You already know that. With that said, man. And happy New Year. Oh, yeah. Happy 2019 to y'all. I feel too, man. Well, that's awesome. And, and like I, uh, I tell everybody who's on our show, um, we really thank you from the bottom of our hearts because without you, there is no show. So, you know, we're glad to have shared this opportunity to get some of your information out there. And um, I encourage anyone who's listening to be prepared for these books that he got coming out, uh, potentially a movie, uh, magazine information. You know, stay tuned to his Facebook Page and also his wife. He, you already got the information. Um, I would like to let everybody know that this show will be available for playback. So um, if you need the link, be sure to connect with Brother James and he'll be able to ship you the link. Um, that way you can listen in to the show from the very beginning. It also will be available on our YouTube channel. So if you have access to YouTube, look up Transparency Library. And you'll be able to to hear all of the shows, all 33 episodes of those who have been on the show, including Mr. Wright. So um, with that being said, we'd like to thank you for tuning in. I want to give a brief shout-out to all of my peoples in Japan. Um, We just added Japan as far as our listening area. We also have the Ukraine. We have Israel. We have Ireland, we have the United States. Um, so uh, I want to I want to give a shout out to all of our listeners. Thank you guys for keeping us open and available. And y'all be blessed and happy New Year. Uh, hopefully, you know you'll bring in the year 
with a positive vibe and continue it all the way throughout the year. Um, and, again, uh, Mr. Wright, I'd like to thank you for being on the show. So with that being said, I want to um, close out by giving you the opportunity to say your final words. Oh, uh, man, final round, United forever are my final words. Allah Yeah. And thank you again. <laughs> All right, well, Oh, you are most welcome, and um, I encourage you to stay safe and, um, you know, be blessed, okay? Yeah, you do likewise, man. All right, take care. Okay, you too. You are live at the Literary Lounge. With your host, Destiny D, bringing you the newest and the brightest of the literary world right to your ear hole. Every Saturday from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Tune in, listen up, and learn something. All right, guys, next week on January the 12th, 2019, we will have none other than the Miss Candy Williams, a.k.a. Arthur Candy. She is the author of the new book, Jealous of the Way He Treats Her. Um, We're looking forward to having her next Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So you guys tune in for episode 34 with author Candy. This is the spot for new hot authors who are given the opportunity to shine. Each Saturday from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we will showcase a new author here at the Literary Lounge. We are taking out the time to give all of our literary friends an opportunity to showcase their work. The new author spotlight is a platform that allows us to ask up to 10 questions or more to give you, the audience, the most in-depth current information about each writer in their literary piece. We will have a new guest every week. Stay tuned. All right, guys. I want you to tune in in the next few minutes because at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, WTLR will be dropping their Snazzy Saturdays Mega Mix. So, with that being said, we're going to have a lot of smooth jazz by the Smooth Jazz All-Stars. So, we have a full hour and 20 minutes of nothing but smooth jazz. So, you guys tune in and listen to Snazzy Saturdays coming up at 2 p.m. We have less than one minute. You guys stay tuned. 